Well, good morning. We are glad that you continue to join KMCC through the online service, and, and we trust that the messages are beneficial to you and to your family. Uh, as we study through the history of the early church, as recorded in the book of Acts, we are reminded through the narrative of how the early church grew and how it thrived. And three things that spurred their growth were corporate worship, fellowship with other believers, and generosity. And if you consider KMCC to be your home church, I would encourage you to please consider how you can more fully enter into these bases of Christian uh, fellowship. First of all, worship by reading your Bible and praying daily and continue to join us for these online worship services each and every week. Number two, fellowship with other believers by emailing or texting or calling the staff and elders or even some friends here at KMCC. We would love to hear from you and to pray for you. And lastly, practice generosity by giving financially to the ministry of KMCC. Your financial gifts make it possible for us to continue to give this offering to you on a weekly basis. So please know that we continue to pray for you all. And uh, as you watch us online, if you have benefited from the services, we would encourage you to please pass along the word to your friends and family so they can join us as well. Be encouraged in the goodness of our God. Uh, Nick Ringer is the CEO of Community Warehouse. In 2018, he became my boss when he hired me to launch Partners in Hope, uh, a prisoner reentry program that would run underneath Community Warehouse's uh, program. And I have great respect for this man as a boss and a friend. Uh, he has a quiet but strong personality. He's a solid leader, a deep man of faith in Jesus. And he always keeps Jesus the center of what he does. Uh, he might be a CEO, but don't let that fool you because he's got a pastor's heart. Uh, he pastored a rural, rural church up in Alaska for many years. Uh, yes, he likes the cold, which I think is a little strange. Uh, he doesn't say, he says Wisconsin ain't cold enough, if you can imagine that. Uh, um, and he was called to pastor at Community Warehouse, uh, where he's been for many years, among those whom society would typically write off, those coming out of incarceration. And uh, as those of us on the tour learned yesterday, uh, when we heard Adam's testimony, you will rarely hear a testimony from anyone coming out of Partners in Hope or Community Warehouse that will not mention Nick as being a vital part of changing their lives as he ministered to them. They see Jesus in him. And so I'm honored to have him come here and speak to you today. So Nick, could you please come up and share with us what God has laid on your heart? Thanks, brother. Thank you, Jason. It's an honor to be here. You have, I don't know who does your stuff, but this is lovely up here. I'm like, took a lot of work. And thank you for having me. I thank you those of you who uh, spent some time yesterday going to meet Adam and seeing the warehouse. Um, we're going to be in Acts today, so if you have a Bible and like to join me, just go to Acts chapter 1. I believe that's where we're going to start it out. Um, before we start, let's, let me just ask the Lord, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are a rock, you are a redeemer, and you we trust. Amen. Uh, I, I so appreciate the starting up in, in your key verse for this session is Acts chapter 8, right? You've all read it multiple times. Nod your head. That just means your head nods. In Acts 1 chapter 8, we see this statement. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Uh, and I was kind of just noodling on this thought this week about you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. Is there any doubts about that? We all acknowledge the fact that when you come to faith, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, correct? And you receive its power, his power in your life. No doubts whatsoever, right? That's, that's just a given. We don't discuss that. We don't argue about that. We don't strategize that. We don't make, you know, conferences about that. But in the very same sentence, it says, 
and you will be my witnesses using the exact same language, using the exact same verbs. You will be just like you will receive. You will be my witnesses. We put conferences together about that, right? <laughs> Not the other one, but this one. This is this. Now, why is that the case? Why is it the case that we want to strategize the witness, right? And, and this is what I really landed on as I started going through this idea. It's like, you know, we want the body of Christ to go and reach the nations, right? We, that's our desire. And we plan that. We, we call people, say, if you feel God calling your heart to Timbuktu or wherever it is, we will pray for you, we will encourage you, we will help you, and we will send you out, right? And we all applaud, we all show out some cash, right? We know how it works. And then I landed on the question, what about the rest of us? Who I never felt a call to Papua New Guinea or Nepal or... What about the rest of us? Are, are we somehow unendowed by the Spirit? No, that's not it. We sang a song in a verse here for, you know, I forget exactly how it goes, but uh, something about going out on the water uh, deeper than I could ever. Do you really mean that? Do you know what it means to be in the deep water? And that in that space, you're asking that God would grow you? You see, as he presents here, I'm going to check my time there, Okay. Um, he's saying, you're going to be my witnesses, and it's going to go from here to here to through the very ends of the earth. And as I started to think about that, there's a whole lot of us that maybe at one time or another decided to go on a mission trip or decided to be called to missions, and there's a whole lot of the rest of us. You know, I'm a farmer by, by birth. My granddaddy and his granddaddy and my dad, all were farmers, right? And so I don't know how I ever landed where I landed other than that God has a means of making us his witnesses, sometimes willingly and sometimes less willingly, all right? And that's what we're going to talk about today because as the book of Acts unfolds, and I'm sure you've read it, the book of Acts unfolds, you know, they try to figure out what the church is. It's happening in Jerusalem, just like they said, and they're, they're doing all their stuff and they're trying to figure out who can become Christians in about the middle, about chapter 10, you know, Peter gets this, this vision from heaven saying, hey, go, to, go, to, go find Cornelius, right? He's calling you, and, his, and the Gentiles start to come into the church, and that creates a lot of friction for the Jews. Can that really be? And they're, they're just fighting it out, right, and trying to figure out what they are and how it works. And then finally, Paul and Barnabas are up in Caesarea, or um, I probably got that town wrong. But they're up there, and they say, hey, let's send these guys out on a mission trip. Right? Let them, let's send these evangelists out. And they pray over them and everything, and poof, out they go. And he's doing around, doing his thing. The mission is going on, right? And that's kind of how it meanders around for a while until you get to Acts chapter 21. And suddenly we're going to see a shift. And I want you to pay close attention to the shift here. Because up to this point, Paul has been, and his guys have been going out and just doing the mission as hard as they could go, right? I mean, they're just evangelizing and sharing gospel every place he can go, and he wants to go to Rome and all of this. And he's, as he goes around through the that Mediterranean area, he gathers up some funds because the people in Jerusalem are hungry and there's a famine or whatever. They're, they're, and so he brings money back to Jerusalem. And as he lands in Jerusalem, he goes to the temple and you should probably dig into that sometime about why if Paul is a, such a the gospel guy versus law guy, why he's in the temple doing, Jason will answer that for you, <laughs> why he's doing blood sacrifices in the temple during this time. But in Acts chapter 21, he gets to Jerusalem, he visits some people, and he's in the temple, and some people seem that don't like him. And they make up a lie about him, and they say, this guy has brought Gentiles into the temple, and he needs to be taken out and stoned to death. 
and they grab him and they're giving him the beating, right? And they're trying to kill him. And it happened along there in the ruckus. The Romans come along, the soldiers here, and they, they, they grab him out of the ruckus and they pull him up. And he says, wait, 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 wait. As, they're, as the Romans are saving his life, they're dragging him out. He says, hold it a second. And this is where you see the shift for the first time. None of us wake up in the morning and say, oh, God, please give me a beating from somebody. That would make my day. We avoid those things, right? We avoid them. I work in the central city. You guys were there yesterday, some of you, right? There's places you don't go. I mean, there's places you don't go at all at night. You know, I get out of Dodge before dark there because it's not safe, right? And that's not, I'm not just saying that to be dramatic. It's real. Two stores down a week ago, at three o'clock in the afternoon, there was a young man executed in a parking lot. Two doors down from where we were. It's real. So we stay away from pain, correct? And danger. Now he's taking a beating out on the steps there, and he says, Wait a second, I have something I need to do. And he says, Give me a minute. And they say, Okay, what? And he turns around. You see, Paul at this point in time has got Acts 1 8. I will be your witness because the Spirit of God is on me, right? And he turns around, and to the people who are trying to kill him, he shares the gospel of grace. He shares the gospel of salvation to those who are immediately trying to kill him. See, he didn't have a strategy plan to say, oh, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to irritate everybody, and then, uh, and then when they try to kill me, I'm going to, no. What he's realizing is that, if you will, God has called him on the waters to take him deeper. And he's going to be God's person regardless whether it's in the mission plan or it's not. You see that? He turns around and he shares. And they still want to kill him and everything. But, and then the story goes on. So they take him after he shares the gospel to them and they arrest him. They take him a little bit later in chapter 22, and they said, we're going to put him to je- and we're take him and put him to death. And so they have these trials, and every time they stand up to give him a beating, he stands up and shares the gospel. None of us want that. And the time goes on, and you can kind of work your way through chapters 21, 22, and 23. He's in there, and um, they make a plot. They want to kill him. He goes to the governor. He testifies to Christ before the governor. Then he goes before Felix. He goes before all these things. And what's happening is every time he's mishandled, mistreated, falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, he views it not as, you know, if I could really get a plan to get out of this, I'm going to go out and do the mission, right? I'm going to be the witness if I can just get out of the mess I'm in. Now, I'm going to draw the connection because to me it's very clear to us right here today. Some of you are looking to say, I don't know how I'm going to be a witness. The Spirit on you, Spirit in you, you are a witness. My mentor used to say, just bloom where you're planted. I got that because I was a farmer, right? You know, stuff doesn't bloom where it's not planted, right? You just, where you're at. And so Paul is finally getting this picture. Two years. Two years, he's falsely imprisoned. He's mistreated. He's, they're trying to kill him. All of this stuff is going wrong until the, finally they convince, they're trying to get a bribe out of him. They, they convince uh, <clears throat> them that he, they were going to send him down, put him before the Jews. He knows he'll be killed. And as a Roman, he, what does he do? He appeals to Caesar, right? I get to go to Caesar because you can't convict me if I'm going to go. So they say, okay, to Caesar you will go. And so they say, send him to Rome. And this is where the story really picks up. And it's critical to understand Paul's life is not where he wanted. He was on a plan. He had a mission. He had all these churches that he had planted. He was going to go back and encourage them. He was going to go do what he did. And the question is for you when life isn't according to plan do you cease to be the witness that God has planned you to be and what Paul's going to show here is as he would say at one time in season and out of season preach the word and the word there in the language means evangelize in season and out of season 
What happens when you're falsely imprisoned? What happens when you're misunderstood and mistreated and your plan is now out the window? All the money's gone. Relationships are in tatters. Does the program, does the mission, does the the work stop at that point? What Paul's showing is, and I think in the fullness of his maturity, he is showing that not only does the work not stop, but just keep your eyes open for what's going to happen. So he starts, I mean, I don't know, what witnesses, right, there we go, setting the stage. So the stage has basically been set, but here's what's happened. He's going to go to Rome, chapter 27, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, he's going to go and see Caesar, go for justice, right? The Paul and some other prisoners uh, to a centurion of the Augustan court named Julius, They embarking on a ship of Andromidium, they were about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia. We put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. So the we, when he says that, was probably Luke, Paul, Aristarchus. They're all going to sail together across the Mediterranean. Um, Mediterranean is... Uh, I didn't understand it because I'm a kind of a Midwesterner, right? So I understand Lake Erie. We go fishing for walleyes. I understand a little bit of Lake Michigan. Everybody, anybody ever been out on the lake? Can, it can be a little unnerving, right? Uh, at least to me it could be until I started to realize that um, the Mediterranean, you, you can put like 42 Lake Michigans in the Mediterranean, unless you're going by volume and then it's like 700 because it's like 4,000 feet deep. It's a scary place, all right? So they're going to put out into this ocean on a, no doubt, wooden boat. Um, And then the next day we put in at Sidon, Julius, the the guy, the, the cohort leaders, treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus uh, because the winds were against us. So it's, it's not easy sailing. And we sailed across open sea to Cilicia and Pamphylia and came to Myra or Lycia, and then the Centuria found a ship of Alexandria. So the ship is over to a different ship. And they're going to sail for Italy and put us on board. And we sailed slowly for a number of days, arriving with difficulty off of Snidus. I don't know how to pronounce that. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off of Salome, coasting along with difficulty, and we came to a place called Fair Havens, which is near the city of Lycia. Anybody get seasick? Yeah. I was in Indonesia for a short term, and they put us on a wooden boat out into the, into the Maluku Islands. And I don't get seasick very easily, so I just sat up top, and the whole line of the ship was wrapped around with sick bodies leaning over the rail. It's hilarious when you're not the one being sick. I imagine there's some weird feels going on about this time. They've just been trying to work their way. It's been several days. He's on the ship. And, um, and since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, even because even the fast, which was late in the fall, was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but of our lives. This is an interesting little conversation they have here. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship than what Paul said. And I can see the centurion saying, hmm, itinerant Jewish preacher talking about sailing, pilot of a ship, the owner of the ship, and the sailors. Who who am I going to listen to here, right? (laughs) Yeah, thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. We're going to sail if they say sail, right? And so they disregard his statement there which um, I just find it interesting. He'll he'll get a chance to answer that later. Because the harbor wasn't suitable, they decided the majority, so they voted on it, I guess, decided to put out to sea from there on a chance that somehow they would reach Phoenix, a harbor from Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now that when the south wind blew gently, supposing they had obtained their purpose, they weighed the anchor and sailed along Crete, close to shore. But as soon as a tempestuous wind called a northeaster struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, it gave way, and it was driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat, probably the boat they towed along behind. It's like a, a lifeboat. And after hoisting it up, they used the supports to undergird the ship, 
And then fearing that they would run aground among Sirtis, they lowered the gear. That means probably the sails and all of that. And they were driven along. And since we were violently storm tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And we neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay upon us. Note this in your Bible. All hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Collective term, our. When all hope of our being saved was abandoned. We had given up hope. The hour, the collective. This is it. This is, this is the end of our lives. There's this, you don't get saved out of the Mediterranean in a, in a storm and survive. And they just, they understood that. It was over. I'm like, do Christians do that? Do Christians lose hope? Do Christians face things that are so hard that they're just like, I just give up. I can't do it. Because at the last moment then when you're feeling that I can't do it and I can't, I'm, it's not going to work, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a job, whether it's health, it doesn't matter. I can't put it the pieces together anymore. Asking ourselves a question, what, what about being a witness? Is that gone now that I've given up hope? And the answer is not a chance. Watch this. This is incredible. They had given up hope. They're going to die. They, they just confessed that they, we realized we're going to die. Since, verse 21, we've been without food for a long time. Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me. Now, this is you know, the biblical reason why you never miss a chance to tell somebody, I told you so. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he had to take this opportunity for some reason to say, I told you so. You should have not said sail. Duh. All right, we get that. And then he says, yeah, now I, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the, of the God whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God. It will be as exactly as you've been told. In the middle of a hurricane, when they've given up hope of everything, he's still a witness. Let me tell you what God said. Okay, we know we think we're all going to die, but guess what? God told me tonight we're not going to die. Listen to the word of the Lord. In the middle of a hurricane, I imagine these guys have vomited themselves empty. And he's still being a witness about the word of God. Imagine that. Doesn't stop at that point. He said, we're going to run aground some island. When the 14th night had come, we were driven across the Adriatic or the Mediterranean. See, about midnight, the sailors suspected they were nearing land, so they took soundings, and they found 20 fathoms deep. A little farther, took sounding again, found 15 fathoms. And fearing we might run aground on the rocks, they let down the four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. As the sailors were seeking to escape the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into sea under pretense of laying out anchors, Paul said to the centurion, the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And then the soldiers cut away the ropes in the ship's boats and let it go. He meant what he said. He's still engaged. Weeks in a storm. Weeks in a storm. Still engaged. Still embracing. Still doing what he can do within the capacity that's in front of him. I got to just, for a second, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced the, the terror of life and death of someone near you or yourself. And then put that on a lengthy time. In the, the, what it takes out of you is incredible. A couple years ago, I get a call from my daughter on the East Coast, and she says, your new granddaughter, she's about a month old, is desperately ill. 
and we're not confident she can survive. And then 30 minutes later, I'm in Milwaukee and getting on an airplane, flying out east. Within 12 hours, I'm there. And the child is got pneumonia, suffocating. Almost every hour on the hour, they said, we can't keep her. We got to airlift her to Boston. And for the next month, I sat at the bedside. I did the night shift with my granddaughter as she would slowly fill up with fluids. And then the nurses would come in and suction her lungs and and after a month of that, it lays some trauma on your life. You don't realize what you're going through. Paul's being traumatized. Let's not, let's not think for a second that God will not use your trauma as part of the witness. Get that thought out of your mind that if everything goes good, I will be the witness. What if it's just the opposite of that? In the hospital, watching my granddaughter go to the edge of death and life and death and life didn't stop the fact that we could be a witness and talk about who we are and people of faith. My granddaughter turned two this last two weeks ago. Thank the Lord for that. But it didn't stop what was going on. We were isolated in a room because they thought what she had was contagious. And we'd see the nurses and doctors walk by and glance through the glass. Didn't say a word. They just passed by. And then somebody else would glance through the glass. Finally, I'm like, what's going on? I tell the nurse. I, people keep peeking in here, and I want to know what they're doing. My patients were a little thin at that time. And they're like, they all are looking at what we're calling the miracle child. I said, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, we've never seen a child with that survive. And she's surviving. And we don't know what to do with that. Let me tell you what you do with that. Let me talk to you about someone who does that kind of thing. You see, in the middle of a storm doesn't mean you cease being what God has made you to be. Same with Paul. Paul's like, he just keeps on doing his thing. And the next morning, he's serving people. Watch this. It's about dawn. Urge, Paul urged them, get some food. Today's your 14th day. You've continued in suspense. Without food, you've taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. And not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And then he said these things. He took bread. He gave thanks to God in the presence of everyone. And he began to eat. And they were all encouraged. He ate some food themselves. We're all 276 persons in the ship. And when they'd eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing the wheat into the sea. What does a witness do? A witness serves those around them, even when it's terrible. You see, God said you will be my witnesses, and he meant you're going to be his witnesses. Sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly. You get the opportunity at all times to be the witness. I'm going to do a side story here. I came to Milwaukee not willingly. I'm a farmer, and I was in rural Alaska. I loved Alaska. I was doing what I enjoyed. I was running a Bible college. I was helping in the church. I was, doing, I was having a grand time of my life, right? I'm through some really unpleasant circumstances. I was launched into the sea of frustration dear friends of mine people who I had known for years good Christians had if you will conspired to get me out of my job for no reason that I'm aware of even to this day and they're like we don't want you in your job yeah you're doing fine you're on track you're doing everything we just don't want you in your job no more and I'm like wait a second I have a plan I have a strategic plan. It's a 15-year plan. We're halfway through, and we're killing it. And they're like, goodbye. I confess, I was a little bit angry. Okay, no, I was a lot angry. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do from here. Where do I go? I'm, I don't know. Ended up, I have one of my daughters, my youngest daughter, was having a baby and living in Milwaukee. And I'm like, honey, what do you think? Well, maybe we can come down and help with the baby. 
Okay, Milwaukee it is. So we, Alaska, I'm still angry. Land in Milwaukee. I don't know anything about Milwaukee. I don't know anything about cities. I don't know anything about inner city people. I don't. I don't know any of the language. I don't know where to go, how to be. I, I mean, I got zero street credibility. I got farm credibility, right? That's all I got. <laughs> and in the middle of this craziness of storm, I would have never chose Milwaukee. It wasn't even on the list. I would never chose Milwaukee. But in the middle of all this madness, God chose Milwaukee for me. In the middle of the madness, I can see that God chose a hurricane for Paul. Because watch what happens as a story. So they get to the thing. They're going to go uh, ashore, and I'll keep moving quickly here. They cast off the anchors. Um, Verse 41, but striking the reef, they ran the vessel aground, and the bow was stuck and movable, and the stern was being pounded by the surf. It was coming apart. The ship was being busted apart. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest anyone should swim away and escape, which made a lot of sense because you know the rule. For a Roman you know, prisoner holder, if the guy gets away, you give your space. You go back in his chains or you take his. So let's just kill him. It's, we, can, we can survive that, but we probably couldn't survive if they escaped. And so... The centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. So he said, you don't get to kill him. God is still protecting, God providing. You don't get to kill him. But look around. You know, the guy you've been sailing with for all this time looks at you and says, okay, sorry, buddy. <laughs> this is what you're going to get. How are you feeling towards people about then? Is your attitude slipping at all? Oh, you know how you get a little fussy, a little whiny, a little, little, little snapping at person here. You know how it is. And they jump in, right? They make for land. You grab some wood and you float into the shore. And after they were brought safely through, yeah, you can turn them on. Swords, shipwreck, wet, cold, right? Miserable. How do you do with being miserable? I like cold weather, so... You know, we keep our house at a solid 62 degrees in the wintertime. It's perfect. <laughs> My kids don't visit much. <laughs> I don't understand, right? Watch what he's doing. He might have had a really bad attitude about that time for the people around him. He's wet. He's cold. He's miserable, and they learned that they land on an island called Malta, and the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they had kindled a fire and welcomed us because it began to rain, <laughs> raining too, and was cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, what? I'm not much in the mood of gathering sticks for people who just wanted to kill me. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm cold. I'm wet. Why am I out gathering sticks for other people's fire? You know how that would feel just a little bit? But not Paul, man. He gets it. He gets it that you, we are witnesses always. Doesn't matter if it's in a hurricane. Doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter if people mistreat you. You're still, and he goes out and he gathers and he serves people. And he takes this big old thing of sticks. You can do the next one. And out of the fire comes this poisonous snake and latches on his hand. And he's like, Really? <laughs> really he shakes the snake off and the snake dies and all the natives sit back and watch this is entertainment for them right hmm. he just got bit by that poisonous snake nobody survives that let's see what how long it takes before he goes and they watch and they wait that's real stuff friends of ours from indonesia was there when i was in a visit one of the kids was swimming in the river horrifically venomous water snake bit, bites him on his finger and and within within a matter of an hour he's unconscious and he's turning light blue he's just he's dying they put him on a boat 12 hours by boat take him to the thing his arms like this big around they split his arm in the doctor's office they give him antivenom to do everything they can and he survives native people in the village in Indonesia nobody survives that how did he survive 
<laughs> we're witnesses, right? He became a witness. Shake it off. They think, okay, he must be a god. Not a god. He goes on. He serves people further. The, the leader in the, the island there uh, was sick with dysentery and all these other things. He lays hands, serves him, heals him. They treat him well, and then the story goes on. But you need to do a little research on the island of Malta. You see, the, when it says the native people there, it says that word twice. What it really means is barbarians. They didn't speak Greek. They, they, were, they were people who, they, they were really coming to the ends of the earth. You see, Paul would be used by God to be taken through the horrific stuff of false imprisonment and beatings and all this nastiness, hurricanes and shipwrecks and threats of his life and rain and cold and snake bites. And even in the middle of all of that, he is still a witness. You see, we have misunderstood. I have misunderstood that if it's all good, it's okay, right? And then I can be a witness. But if it's bad, then I try to figure out how to make it good so I can be a witness again. And I am wrong when I think that way. Listen, folks. We are witnesses right where we are in the middle of the, the craziness of your life. You are witnesses. That's how it works. God does not waste terrible circumstances. He uses them often. I mean, we got an antagonistic culture. We get unfair treatment. How do you handle that? How do you handle when they don't like Christians anymore? Yeah, well, it's been that way in China a long time. The work goes on. The witnesses continue, right? I keep asking myself the question, and this is the question I keep asking. How many times along that thing could have Paul says, no, I'm done. I quit. How many exits were there where he could have just said, it's enough. I don't want to go through any more pain in this whole following God stuff. If God was really God, why didn't he treat me nice? I think Paul finally gets the truth of the matter. Whether you're on a mission as planned and everything is going great, or when you're in a hurricane and nothing's going right, you're still the witness. God doesn't waste the horrors of life. And I hate to say it that way, but it's exactly true. Last story. When I was at the Bible college, there was a young woman and her sister that were students there, and they were raised in a big family back in the woods. And they were just sweet, sweet young ladies. And as time would go on, what what would come to the surface was is that they had spent most of their life being abused by their father and their older brothers. And when they come to the realization that's not normal life, that it was actually very, very horrible, the wheels come off just trying to, to deal with the trauma. And, and, counselors and all this stuff went with it but it just became too much and this sweet girl um, just couldn't live with that trauma and on one given evening she tries to end her existence and if somebody finds her they take her to the hospital and then to the psych ward and they bring her back to health and of course there's you know her a huge family there's like 30 people there loving on her and crying with her and caring for her and all of that part and and she looks over and she sees in the corner another girl that had come in with the same situation and no one came no one came to see her to love on her, to express how much they cared. And so this sweet girl goes over to this other girl in compassion and puts her arms around her and shares how much Jesus loves her. And she receives Christ in the psych ward. 
Is God in the business of making us witnesses all the time in the midst of the horrors of life? Absolutely. My encouragement to you, if he can take the cross, the worst that can happen and save the world, he can take your worst moments and the hardest stuff of your life and he can make you a witness to those around you. Listen, I shouldn't be in Milwaukee. I don't have any credibility, but you know what? I showed up and decided I'll just do whatever you have for me, God. I only got one job offer, community warehouse. Crazy. And decided I'll just serve what a that I have. And you know what? God does the work. God does the work. I just needed to be available. And he's done amazing things in spite of me, in spite of my frustration and anger. And God will do amazing things with you. If you will just but be a witness, let the spirit that's in you strengthen you and be a witness no matter what. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your servants here. Thank you for touching each of their lives. Thank you for Jason and Kelly and the family and the work that's going on here. I pray that you would encourage them, encourage each of our hearts to commit to being a witness wherever we're at, in whatever circumstances you've placed us in, that you and your message would go forward, that whatever it is, that we could continue to keep you on our lips. We thank you. We praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and his saving grace towards us. In his name we pray. Amen. I know I kind of like him a little bit. Yeah, what a man of faith. I appreciate that. Thank you, Nick, so much. Um, why don't you stand? We're going to have our benediction. Uh, again, I would encourage you to go out into the foyer and, and greet the ministry leaders by their tables. Actually, you guys, you can go out there and, and stand by your tables and get ready and um, spend some time getting to know one another, getting to know those folks and hearing about the ministries that they're part of and how you can come alongside, either volunteer or give or just become part of those organizations and uh, enjoy the coffees, uh, the coffee and cupcakes on us, all right? Um, why don't you receive this benediction now from Romans chapter 1. May you not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful week. Everybody, thank you again for watching this online service today. We just want to remind you that you can go on our website, kmcc.org, and get in contact with us. We would love to be able to talk with you. You can send us an email. You can give us a call, whatever you'd like to do. We'd love to be in touch with you. Also, you can give online on our website at our homepage. There is a give button right there at the top of the page. Click on that. It'll redirect you to a new page, and you can give that way, or you can give through the mail, whatever is best for you. Anyway, we just want to thank you again for joining us this morning, and please tune in next week for our next online service. Have a great week.